All right, next up we're gonna talk about all the different menus and there's tons of them. It's about 152 the last time I counted, depending on which firmware update you're on. But it's a lot. Some of them we're gonna just bypass all together. Let me just kind of guide you through and maybe avoid some confusion because the Sony menus can be somewhat confusing, especially if we're coming from Canon or Nikon. The uh, menus can be a little bit on the frustrating side. You see where it says aspect ratio and there's a little icon with mountains in it? That's a, like a photography only related item. And we're gonna be bypassing a lot of them. Although, when it comes to shooting like time lapses, we're gonna talk about them, but we'll do it fairly quickly. If we go over to the next page, uh, you see where there's a film strip next to file format? That indicates basically that uh, it's a movie only related item. And we'll be definitely dealing with those a lot more. To help you around a little bit less of the confusion and maybe a way to think about it is on terms of these major tabs. So the first one is what's called the camera settings. Uh, next one is called the custom settings. Then you get your wireless, your applications, your playback, and kind of like your utility, it's a toolbox. That's actually what they call as a setup tab. Let's start at the very end. We'll eliminate the easy stuff. This is kind of like stuff that you don't touch that often, like HDMI settings, um, formatting the card, copyright information, stuff that you don't get to. And that's why it's all the way on the far right side. Now, if we go to the playback menu, that's pretty darn obvious. Um, apps is pretty obvious. Wireless is pretty obvious. So it leads these two, and this is where the most of the confusion comes is between this one and this one. The base, best thing I can tell you is this first tab is more of your acquisition, how you're acquiring the image, like your file format, if it's RAW or JPEG. Um, and then this one with the gear icon is more of like tools to acquire the image. So like zebras, and now here's a lot of people get confused and I even get confused too is it's not quite that simple. Like, yeah, here's zebras and stuff like that, but you'll get into um, focus. There's autofocus here, like pre autofocus. There's tools that will help acquire the image like I talked about. But over here, we've got a lot of autofocus type of um, information over on this side too. So they're kind of spread out and it's a little bit confusing. So there's a couple ways you can navigate the menu. So if you go all the way to the end where the uh, setup menu is, and we go to tile menu, you actually can turn this on. And basically what this is going to do is when you press the menu button, you'll get this. So you can get to the camera settings, custom settings, wireless, all that stuff somewhat quickly, I guess you could say. All right, my best advice is assign as much as you can to the function button or custom button so you don't have to go deep into the menu. Um, that's my best advice, you know, nail down exactly what you get to most often and customize it. So let's get started. We got a lot to do. So um, this is photography only, but uh, we'll say if you're doing time lapses, um, you got 42 megapixel if you're doing full frame. And if you're doing crop mode, APS-C 30, 35, Super 35, I believe it's 18 megapixels. So if you're doing um, time lapses, um, I, I personally do raw. Now, if you go down to aspect ratio, again, this is um, photography, but if you're doing time lapses, you have your choice between 16 by nine or three by two. So 16 by nine is what we normally shoot. That's our aspect ratio for video. Um, if you're really confident on your framing, use that. But if you wanna have some more wiggle room later in post to kind of move around the image with your time lapse, then shoot three by two, because you'll get more information that way. Quality. Um, this is photography only. Again, you could do raw, JPEG, extra fine, a whole bunch of stuff like that. Um, this is something they just added new. So if you're on an old firmware update, um, old firmware version, you won't see this as raw file type. You can do compressed or uncompressed, which makes a larger file. And for people that are doing astrophotography, what I understand, I'm not an astrophotography kind of guy, you'll get actually better images that way. So if you're doing a time lapse for the star, stars going over, um, you might want to try the uncompressed. Panorama size, that's photography only. We're gonna skip that. Um, skip this as well, photography only. All right, going to page two at the top, we got file format. So we've got a whole bunch of different varieties. Starting, we're gonna start at the bottom. <clears throat> MP4, older Kodak, um, lowest bit rate, uh, lowest quality. I'm gonna be showing some uh, demos of each Kodak here in a second. Um, it works well if you want to transfer it to your smartphone, use it as proxies. Um, it won't record 4K, 
And also AVC HD won't record 4K. The only one we'll do it is XAVC-S, which is a more modern day Kodak. AVC HD, that one is was more meant for, I believe, Blu-rays, DVD authoring. Um, it's an older Kodak as well. Uh, ha has a higher bit rate than MP4, um, but is still pretty low by today's standards. Our XAVC-S 4K and HD, these are more modern day Kodaks and they get the bit rate up a much higher. And with more bit rate, um, you'll get more or less artifacting, which I'm gonna demonstrate here in a second. So let's go ahead and demonstrate that. All right, I wanna step through all the different ones. Here's MP4, average bit rate's pretty low, 16 meg. Then we're gonna go to X, or sorry, ABC HD, uh, 21 meg. And we've got XAVC S, uh, 47 meg. This is 1080. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna zoom in so you can see this. What's great about leaves is they're very random, so it's hard for the Kodak to predict what's going to happen. And um, you can really see the artifacts here. When we go to 1080, average bit rate of 47, you can see there's not much artifacts at all going on. And we go to 4K, you can see the image is more detailed because we have higher resolution and we're zoomed in the same amount. Um, right here, I've gone to ProRes, which you take the HDMI out of this um, camera and go to like a Shogun. You can see I'm going through the, a lot of different bit rates. Um, the quality, or actually the bit rate goes up, and the quality should too. But what I've noticed over time, and here's DNX HR, is that the XAVCS that's internal to the camera is really comparable to the ProRes and DNX HR um, codecs that I'm showing you right here. This one, like close to what, 700 meg, so much higher, requires a lot more. Um, and here I've gone all the way back down to MP4 to give you an idea of what it was on the lower end of the scale. And here is a freeze frame of two different codecs. So you've got the internal codec on the top at 100, almost 100 meg, and then you've got the highest bit rate going into the uh, Shogun at almost 700. And if you pixel peep and you look at it so closely, it's really hard to tell the difference between the two. Just by the nature of doing this course, running lots of tests, I get to the point where I, I'm doing lots of pixel peeping. A lot of times I will do side-by-side com -side comparisons. I'll put them up on the timeline. I won't label them and I'll come back later and I'll put them side-by-side -side and I'm like, I don't know which one's which. And sometimes when I'm comparing Kodaks, I'm like, I can't tell the difference at all. So if you have like a, a quality graph where MP4 is at the bottom, lowest bit rate, and as you could see, there was a big difference because it had a lot of artifacting, a lot of strange things going on around the leaves. And then you go AVC HD, uh, bigger jump in quality. You know, we got to see less artifacting. But when you go from there to like X AVC S, which is what we're using for a 4K internal recording to our SD card, it looks really good. So good that kind of the ProRes is our like industry standard. It almost meets at the top in terms of quality. I mean, we're comparing 100 meg to like 700 meg um, bit rates and they're like neck and neck super close. Now I am not a professional colorist. I don't push my images around as much as professional colorists do. They kind of stretch the image. They will change the colors and the shadows and the highlights and they'll, they'll push it around a lot. And what they talk about is codecs that break down when they, they push it too hard. Now the XAVC-S in 4K requires a very decent computer. In fact, some older programs, like I think it's Final Cut um, 7, I don't own it, I'm not um, a Mac person, but I understand that Kodak does not work on that editing platform. As well as Resolve 12, if you're on the Windows platform, when you bring it and you put it on the timeline, um, the audio will not appear. So there's a problem there. Hopefully Resolve or a Black Magic will address that and they'll fix that because you could actually use uh, Resolve 12 as an editor now. It's not only an advanced color grading application. So if you have those two programs and you have this camera, XAVC-S might not work for you. So you might have to go down to AVC-HD. I think if you do and you've purchased this kind of camera, I think you need to upgrade your um, editing program to be like Final Cut X or Premiere Pro or maybe use Edius or some other NLE. All right, next up when we talk about this particular Kodak XAVC-S, we need to talk about 8-bit versus 10-bit. This camera is only an 8-bit camera. It doesn't output 10-bit via the HDMI, for instance, none of that. So what does 8-bit mean? So let's say you're shooting a wall, and the way you had it lit, 
you're raking the light across the wall, let's say. There's pure white on one side, pure black on the other side, and you're recording it with your camera. It's 8-bit. Basically, what you're going to see is you're going to have 256 shades of tonality between the purest white and purest black. Well, if it was a 10-bit camera, which colorists love, um, you would have approximately 1,024 shades of tonality between white and black. So what does this all mean? It means that if you're shooting an S-Log um, with an 8-bit camera, and basically what S-Log does, it takes your image and squashes it. I'm going to be demonstrating all this later, but basically I'm just going to use my hands to demonstrate this for right now. It, it squashes the signal in the camera. And then what you have to do later in post is pull it out. So you pull the whites to be white, the blacks to be black. And what happens is when you stretch it in the 8-bit format, lines will start to develop because you're stretched so far you've broken the signal. Basically, you've, you've created cracks in the signal when you've done it so much and it's only 8-bit. If you had 10-bit, you wouldn't see that as much because you've got more lines of that gradient, basically, and you wouldn't see it come apart. My personal opinion on XAVCS, even though it's 8-bit, you can get really good results out of it as long as you don't push it too far. Now, I know a lot of colorists will say 8-bit and they'll like, no, it's just no good. You can't shoot that way. But this example right here, which is done in S-Log, I think works really well. That being said, you still want to be careful of banding with this 8-bit codec. Let me show you something on the A7S is on the left, recorded at 50 meg, A7R2 on the right, recorded at 100 meg, both with this exact same codec. They look a little bit different, but believe me, they're actually recorded with the same exact creative style, contrast, and saturation. Now this is gonna be very subtle, and it might be hard to pick up on, but I'm gonna show you a very subtle uh, example, and I'll show you an aggressive sample after this one. So as I pan up into the sky, and I get just about where the mountains are out of frame, You'll see uh, on the A7S, which are recorded at a lower bit rate, kind of horizontal, almost arcing type of bands are starting to occur. It's really, really subtle. You might not be able to notice it. If you look at the waveform monitor, you look in the blue channel at the very top, you can kind of almost see these lines developing very subtly that you don't see over on the A7S that was recorded at a higher bit rate. So let's continue. We're gonna pan all the way up. get to the top and then we'll start going back down again and right about there before we see the mountains is where you might see that banding occur so that was a very subtle example now let's crank it up <laughs> let's try to destroy the image um, this is the a7r2 recorded at 100 meg same codec obviously and now when i go up into the sky you'll notice this big arc going from a very light blue to a very dark blue if we look at the waveform monitor, and we actually look between 90 and 80 IRE, we'll notice that there's no signal at all. The signal is totally broken apart. And this is an e extreme example of banding. So the point I'm trying to make here, as long as you don't stretch the image too much with this 8-bit format, you'll probably do just fine. All right, the last thing we've got to talk about when we talk about Kodaks is 422 versus 420. You might have seen those numbers in the specs when you purchase this camera. You might have no idea what they mean. To be honest with you, I didn't write the Wikipedia page on chroma subsampling. I'm no expert here. I have talked to a lot of colorists. I'm going to show you some tests here in a second. But basically, 422, which comes out of the HDMI cable, versus 420, this is done internally to the SD card, uh, the 420 has less color information, basically. So I've talked to a lot of colorists, and I'm like, well, how do I test this? How do I demonstrate the difference between internal versus external recording? And they say, well, Shoot something on a green screen, have it move, and then you should see uh, like lines of hair. Like So what I did basically, I'm going to show you, I took one of my girl's dolls, put it on a ro revolving um, plate basically, and on, along the hair, the edge of the hair, you should see like more artifacts basically happening on the internal Kodak, the 420, because there's less sampling done of the color at that point. This is your internal um, Kodak, a 420. And what I did here is, so normally behind her would be a green screen and I basically keyed it and I copied the keying information from this to the other file, which I'm about to show you. So now that you've looked at the edges of the hair, I think I've pulled a fairly good key on this. Um, not too bad. And now here is the ProRes version and it's 4 to 
two. Um, and you might be looking at it and say, well, from this, I really can't see a difference. And I can't either. So let's zoom in. So this is four, two, zero, internal. And now, boom, right there, you're at four, two, two. Now you'll say, well, wait a minute, do that again. So here's four, two, zero, and here's four, two, two. And you're like, well, wait, the Shogun from the four, two, two actually looks worse. And to me, it does as well. And you say, well, wait, it should look actually better around the edge of the hair. And let me explain what's going on here if I understand it correctly. So when you're recording to the SD card, it passes through a chip. And in that chip, uh, that particular processor is doing noise reduction on the fly. And I think this camera does a lot of noise, especially at 12,800. It's doing some pretty aggressive noise reduction. It's looking at it and saying, hey, I think this is noise. Maybe I can cancel it out and create a cleaner image. And so, but what's coming out of the HDMI is a clean signal. So it's bypassing some of those chips or processors or whatever is going on in the camera and it's not applying noise reduction. So in this particular instance, recording 422 output is actually, in my opinion, worse because we've got more noise. Now, in post, we could add noise reduction back in. Um, noise reduction comes at a price, though. It's very CPU or graphic GPU intensive, depending on what program you're using. Um, it can slow down your editing process greatly. Uh, and the final render and all that stuff just slows down to halt, and many computers can't even play back real time when you apply noise reduction. It's probably the one of the hardest things for a computer to do, especially with 4K footage. So if you're looking to do green screen, and kind of the, what I want to say here in a nutshell, and I know I've gotten somewhat technical talking about 422 and 8-bit, 10-bit, and all this stuff, is basically you just want to be aware of what the Kodak can do and do well. And I, I think in this instance, you can pull very good keys is if you light your green screen really well, if that's the type of work you're doing. Let's say you're doing a YouTube video and you have green behind you and you want to key that out and put like, make it look like you're in a big office building or something like that. You can do that. And I think it works quite well. What I'm just want to try to reiterate is this is a very good Kodak XAVCS. We've got a high bit rate. You know, 420 works great on green screen, and it's 8-bit, and as long as, we're gonna talk about S-Log later, as long as you expose properly for the 8-bit, you'll be in pretty good shape. All right, moving down, we have record settings. So we've got a lot of different numbers here. So really quick, I'll explain. The number on the right, all the 50s that you see, 50M, that stands for 50 meg, that's your, your bit rate. And you'll see a bunch of numbers on the left with Ps. The P stands for progressive rather than interlaced. Um, and the number, like 24, stands for 24 frames per second. So if you're doing movies, it's when you go to a movie theater, it's 24 frames per second. Um, if you're watching TV, it might be 30 frames per second. So if you're recording stuff for broadcast, you might be requested to do it in 30. Um, now if you're wanting to go to 60 or if you're doing sports and you want to capture as much information as possible and you want to what's called over cranking, um, an older term from my understanding, if basically you're shooting for slow motion. Um, sometimes you'll just shoot 60p because you'll get um, a much a, a different feel in terms of the motion. Um, and then you can also go to 120. So basically what happens if you shoot 60, um, and then you slow it down in your editor and stretch that um, clip out um, from 60 frames and you stretch it to 24 on the timeline, you'll get very silky smooth uh, slow motion. And the same thing with 120, it'll get even, even slower. All right, moving down, we got dual video record. You can turn this on or off. So basically what it does is it takes your highest quality, like an XAVCS, and it'll also record an MP4 at the lowest quality at the exact same time. So it's writing two separate files to your card. Now, why would you do this? I personally never do, but if you're a broadcaster um, and you're wanting to get something out to um, send it over your smartphone, um, you could do it. You could transfer it to smartphone and then send it. It creates a much smaller file size. The quality's lower. Um, you will not be able to shoot any sort of 60p, 120p, on none of that. You're left with like 24 or 30 um, frames per second. So you've got some limitations there. But if you need to, also you could create smaller um, file sizes just for proxies, like I talked about before. You could put out your computer and have it, um, let's say your laptop, it's a very old laptop, and that's all you could do is you wanna get start editing and you wanna replace those files later with the actual you know, 4K 
XAVCS file formats, you could definitely do that. All right, moving on the way down, we got drive mode, photography only, could skip, we could skip this, we could skip that, flash, red eye, only photography. Now we get to focus mode. So if we press the select button, we've got autofocus, continue, continuous autofocus and manual autofocus. And you'll see all these other ones are grayed out. Now if you're following along on the mode dial, we're in movie mode, but I'm gonna switch it to M. Now what I have to do now, instead of going back into the menu, I'm gonna hit the C3 button because I've already assigned that to focus mode. And we're gonna go ahead and start at the top. I'm gonna to talk about focus more in depth later, but I wanna run through all these really quickly. So starting at the top, we've got single shot AF. So if I press the shutter halfway down, it locks onto something and then keeps it there. It won't change the focus at all after that. So if you're, let's say you're doing an interview and you just say, oh, grab focus. You saw the box go around the person's face. You're good. You hit record and you're golden. Now, because you can record video in stills mode like we are. Now, if you go to back to C3 button, if I go on to AFA, automatic autofocus, basically what it does is like, let's say there's a child. I think that's the example that Sony gives. If the child is stationary, doesn't move, it uses the autofocus single. And then if the child starts to move, it intelligently knows this and says, oh, I'm just going to I'm going to automatically switch to autofocus continuous. So that's what that does. Autofocus continuous, um, it does what it says. It continually autofocuses. Now I've used this in interviews at f2.8. Person work, you know, moving around in the frame and uh, it worked really well. I was pretty amazed. Um, the autofocus on this camera is pretty darn good. And we're, again, we're going to talk more about this later. So uh, DMF stands for direct manual focus. So if I press the shutter halfway down and I start to move the barrel on this 35 millimeter f2.8 um, lens, you'll see this graph up here. All the way to the right is landscape, so an infinity mark, and then it shows like a person's face, so if you're like doing a portrait. So near on the left, far on the right. So if I release my finger off the shutter, um, it doesn't move. So this is actually a really powerful tool. So you can actually grab focus, and then fine tune it from there just a little bit, moving the barrel. I love this. And this is one of the, we're gonna go talk about the pros and cons of shooting in a stills mode, but this is, when you're doing with focus like this and it's constantly changing, this is a really great thing to have. You can lock on the focus and then fine tune it from there. It's really, really cool. So moving on the way down, we've got manual focus. It does exactly what it says if I start to move the barrel. Um, it'll do it. If I press the shutter button, absolutely nothing happens. All right, moving our way down, focus area. We've got a whole bunch of different things we can choose from. There's a whole bunch of them. Some are grayed out, some aren't. Um, so basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually get out of here. I'm going to press the shutter halfway down, and I'm going to actually press the select button around the jog wheel in the back. If you remember, I customized that to be um, focus area. So I actually can get to it from here. And I like getting it to it from here because that's just the way my muscle memory is. So you can step through all the different ones and you're gonna see some are grayed out. And the ones that are grayed out, the lock on, do not work in video mode, so we're not even gonna talk about them. But starting at the first one here is wide. If I select that, it basically uses all the available focus points when we're shooting video. If I turn the jog wheel again to zone, when I move the front or rear dial, I can move these nine boxes around. And basically what I was doing here, like when I was shooting a volleyball match, I actually put it in this kind of up position right here. And if I press the shutter halfway down, you can see them all turn green. But basically those, those nine points um, are really nice to have because um, the volleyball and the player's faces were usually above or are in the top portion of the frame. So I had it that way and that was working really well for continuous autofocus. If I press the select button again and rotate it We've got center, and all this does is center. You can't move this box, it can't change the size, it's just that, which I don't use that often, actually. If we rotate it again, we have flexible spot single, medium, and large. Um, these three are pretty much the same thing, they're just different sizes, so we'll just demonstrate on the small. So if I move the um, front dial or rear dial, I can move it around. Now, if you're doing it like an interviewer, let's say, and you just want to put this box around the person's face, you, in the, you're using the rule of thirds, you can move it over here, and it'll always, whatever's inside that box will keep it in focus. Um, if that 
object should move outside that small little box, it will not look at it at all. Um, and I've used this before, like on interviews, I wouldn't use a small one. I'd actually use flexible spot, use like medium or large. And you can see the size of the box as I move it around. And this is usually a good size for somebody's face if you're doing a typical interview and they're like, I don't know, six, eight feet away. You could put this right on their face. And as long as they don't move outside that box, um, you can do, you'll do fine. Especially if, if another person enters the frame and it sees a face and the face starts moving in front of that other person or around them, um, it might get confused and say, hey, I wanna like focus on that person. But if you only wanna focus just on that person, it's only gonna focus what's in that box. And it does an extremely strict job about it. We've got expanded a flexible spot. So if I pick this, I don't know if you can see it. Let me highlight it for you. You can see when I move it around, there's two boxes. There's what's inside the box. It's going to give priority. And then if it can't find anything or it's having a problem, it'll actually expand itself out to that um, dashed box around it and focus on that. And like I said before, the rest of them are not video related, so we really can't use it and I won't talk about those. I remember I was saying that, you know, Sony's menus can be somewhat confusing. This is one of those confusing ones. So you got focus area. If I select it, you'll see all these boxes that we just talked about. Then if we go to the next page, we have focus settings. And if I hit select button, you'll see that we can get to them this way as well. So there's these two different ways. And this is actually focus settings is actually what I've programmed to the center um, select button on the jog wheel. They do the exact same thing. Um, they have two different looks to them, but uh, that adds to that kind of Sony menu confusion type thing. All right, working our way down, we have AF Illuminator. This is where you can turn it off if the lamp is bothering you, or you can leave it on auto. Again, this only works in stills mode, so you can shoot video in stills mode and use that to grab some focus in very low light. Also, I want to add that the manual says you cannot use it with AMAP adapter. I can't verify that. I don't have any AMAP adapters. All right, we have AF drive speed and AF track sensitivity. Um, we're gonna have a whole chapter on this, but really quickly, I just wanna say that um, drive speed, how fast the autofocus works. So if you got one object and you're focusing to another object maybe behind it, um, how fast when you move your box or whatever is tracking it, how fast will it go? If you have a fast, it's like snap focus. It goes boom. If normal, it kind of goes, uh, goes to the next one. If you have a slow, it goes really slow to the next one. And I'll give more examples later in the next, uh, in the focus chapter. Working our way down, we have track sensitivity. So you can have it in high or normal. And this is basically how sensitive do you want it to um, track something? So let's say somebody, you're, you're filming somebody, somebody's face, let's say, um, and you're, tr you're tracking that particular person and somebody walks across in front of them. Well, if you have the high sense set to high, let's say high sensitivity, what's gonna happen is that person walking in front of the other person, it's gonna grab them. If you don't want that to happen, you might wanna leave that at normal. Again, I'm gonna be showing a lot of examples of this later. Exposure compensation, like I've talked about before, I wouldn't recommend doing it this way, but here, let me, I'll show you. Uh, I'm in movie mode, and if you wanted to, you can actually rotate the exposure compensation dial. And you can see it's getting brighter and it's getting darker. And it'll only do it two stops. And the dial does three on either side, but it'll only do two. And I can go back to zero. I wouldn't recommend adjusting your exposure using this dial at all. Um, now, the only time it'll work is, watch this. If I go into out of auto ISO and I go to ISO 100, I go back into the menu and you can see it's grayed out. You can't choose that because it needs to be on auto ISO in, in order for this to work. Again, really advise against using it that way. Exposure step. I would advise to set it to a third of a stop instead of a half of a stop. It gives you more control over your exposure. So I would just leave it at third of a stop. Just to demonstrate this really quickly. See if we're on F10, I'm gonna remove the aperture. There's F11, 13, and 14. Let's go back to 10 again, and then I'll change this really quickly to a half step, and then do the same thing. See, so now we're at 9.5, then it goes 11, 13, and then 16. So um, you're losing control, basically, so I would recommend just leaving it on a third of a stop. All right, next up is ISO. I'm actually in um, M mode right now on the mode dial, not movie mode, M mode to demonstrate some of these things. Um, so ISO, what is ISO? Basically, the best example I can give to you is an amplifier, like in your stereo system. 
let's say you don't have any music passing through it. You go up to your speaker, put your ear all the way up to it. You turn the amplifier all the way down and you don't hear anything. You turn it all the way up, no music playing. You put your ear up to it and you can hear a pshh, kind of a hiss. Well, that's noise. Um, now, the same thing is happening on our sensor. Basically, we're turning up the gain, we're turning up the volume on the sensor. Instead of it getting louder, it gets brighter. And along with that, just like the uh, stereo system, it gets noisier, so does the image. It gets brighter, but it'll also get noisier. So when we're in movie mode, our minimum ISO we can do is uh, 100. And then you can go up from there, and as you can see, it's getting very bright. And as you can see over in the uh, on my shade there on the side, it's getting also very noisy. So one of the things I wanna show you is a trick that I do when I've forgotten my ND filter, and I've done that many times, and I don't wanna shoot at F22. You can see right now I'm at F22. And so what I'll do is I'll shoot actually in stills mode, the M on the, M on the dial here. And then what I'll do is instead of shooting at F22 where many lenses are not at their sharpest. Um, I'll shoot it at like f16. I'll bring it down a stop. And then what I'll do here, um, here instead of ISO 100, I will bring this down to ISO 50. I'm not getting the best image like ISO 100, um, but I'm definitely getting a sharper part of my lens. So I'll definitely do that in the cases of when I've forgotten my ND filter. So now, what I'll do is I'm going to move to a movie mode. There's two parameters that you can change, which is kind of neat. You got auto, I, auto ISO minimum and auto ISO maximum, and these are in one-stop increments. As you can see, we're at 1600, 3200, 64 is doubling. Um, we'll get more to, into the exposure later, but basically, what I want to show you here is. If you had a scene and you're like a one-man band like myself and you're not like Shane Hurlbut, a DP that does Hollywood films and has a whole bunch of people around him on the camera pulling focus and changing, you know, ND filters and doing all this stuff on the fly. Um, and maybe you're on a gimbal and you're wanting to do this scene where you're tracking somebody from inside to outside. Well, let me show you. It's not the greatest example, but it's you know, I'm just pointing at my headphones here. And as you can see, when I move it outside, it's going from 6400 all the way down. The gain's being clamped down to um, 100 ISO. Now, if I didn't do that, I didn't set it up this way, and I was looking at the headphones and then I, I framed it to the outside, it would get totally blown out, couldn't use the footage. Um, you might think to yourself, well, I could just you know, do a cut and then get a different framing from perspective from outside and do it that way. And that's normally how I do it. But if you're looking to do this continuous one shot from a, you know, very different lighting situations um, from inside to outside, um, this is definitely something that you could try. I don't normally use it this way, but um, it, it's a definitely a possibility or a tool that you can use for when you're filming. ISO auto minimum shutter speed. Um, gosh, I've tried this many different ways. and. Everything that I show you here, I've tried and I've tested. I don't just go off by somebody else, what they've done on their YouTube channel. I've actually have tested it and I could never get this to work. You'd have to be in P or A mode to actually make this work. Um, basically it sets the um, minimum shutter speed to when the auto ISO kicks in. I've tried doing this many times. You're gonna get motion blur, uh, way too much motion blur if you try this. Um, I just devised. <laughs> against this. Not a cop out. I've tried it. I just couldn't make it work. So I'd advise just not even using it. All right. Now I've gone back to movie mode and now we're down to metering mode. So we've got three different types. We've got multi center and spot. Most cameras have these three type of uh, metering and we're gonna have a whole chapter on exposure. So I don't want to go into this in too much detail. Multi, at least to, there's a very long winded explanation of how they derive the uh, calculations for multi, I'm not even gonna read it, but basically looks at most of the frame, pretty much all of the frame. And let me show you an example. So right now I'm at F10 um, and I'll move the camera around um, and you can see, we see where it says MM and there's a plus or minus uh, 0, 0.0. Well, that's your meter. It's telling you right now you're properly exposed. It says zero, you're not underexposed or overexposed. So if I were to move the camera over here, you can see now it says MM and then it says minus, uh, minus 1.3. So now what I'm gonna do is go back into the menu and we're gonna change this to center. And I'm gonna move it to right, see where that box is? I'm gonna move it right where the divider is in my um, sliding windows, window doors, I guess you call them. And you can see now it says a minus 0.3. So we're down a third of a stop exposure. If I go back to multi, 
you're going to see that it says zero. So it's looking at more of the frame. Now, if I were to go to spot, it's going to look at uh, a much smaller portion. In fact, there's a little circle in there. You can almost make it out. It's looking pretty much in that circle. And now you can see, the ex in terms of exposure, we're down a whole stop. So as I move it around, it says, oh, you're good, you're good. And I move it into the darkness, you can say, oh, it's flashing a minus two, which means it can't meter past two stops below. And it's basically saying you're way underexposed. All right, next up is white balance. So you've got a lot of different things that you can choose from in terms of white balance. Let's start at the top. You got automatic white balance saying, hey, just let the camera do it for me. Um, you've got daylight, shade, cloudy. I'm gonna have a whole chapter on white balance. Uh, I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly. Incandescent, um, you got fluorescent, warm light, fluorescent cool white, fluorescent day white, fluorescent daylight, flash, underwater. And then you can actually go in, if you cursor over the right, you can actually change the temperature yourself. As you can see, it's getting warmer as it goes up and it passed through, it got cooler. And then you can also change um, the tint, uh, basically. So if you're dealing with like fluorescent lights that I have here, I usually have to subtract out some green by adding magenta. Um, again, we're gonna get more into that later. And the last thing I wanna show you is if we go down, we've got um, three custom presets. And I now I'm in stills mode, I'm in M on the dial, and you will not see the set, this particular one in movie mode. Unfortunately, I don't know why Sony has done it this way. I don't know why you can't custom white balance um, in movie mode, it would be great. If somebody's watching this, please make that change. <laughs> All right, DRO Auto HDR. If you're in, um, video mode, like I am right now, you'll only get DRO. You won't get the auto HDR. So what is DRO? It's basically, I think it stands for dynamic range optimization. It, then the manual just says D range opt, <laughs> whatever that means. But basically when I read the description in the mail, I'm not going to read it out loud to you, but it sounded like a really scary thing. Kind of reminded me of what the GH4 does. They have a similar feature where they kind of raises the shadows. Um, and, but it does it on a almost a pixel by pixel basis where it'll bring up certain pixels and bring up the ISO and bring other ones down. It was doing something really funky and it gave some nasty results. This, however, doesn't do that. It's very different the way they it reads off in the manual. Basically, it's just, let me show you. Here's a 41 step um, chart and this is with DRO at level five and this is that DRO um, turned off and if you look at the difference between the two curves in terms of a waveform monitor It's basically just giving a bit of a around 20 or maybe 30 IRE giving it a little bump in the shadow So that it's raising the shadows up a little bit now when you get to a higher ISOs You might run into a little bit of issue with um, noise, but to be honest I really haven't and I've tried it in really high ISOs and it works really well depends on how you're exposing image and we're going to talk more about exposure later, but um, here, let me just show you an example. Like if I rotate this and we're, we're off right now, and if I turn it to level five, you can see what it does to the blacks. It's, and it's doing a little bit to the gray as well. It's bringing that up. It's not doing anything to the whites on that particular chart. Now, if I, you can actually change it to level four, three, two, one. Um, but basically what I'll do, when I need it, I'll just go from off to level five. In fact, this frame that you see me in right now, I'm using DRO at level five on my A7S because I just wanted to bring up some of these shadows like the camera, um, like the keyboard and the monitor and the speaker in the background. I just wanted to bring that up a little bit so I can control that contrast a little easier in post. We're gonna talk more about exposure and all that stuff later, but basically let me just show you a few examples. This one right here of the pool, this is with the DRO off. And watch the bush when we go to DRO level five. It just basically brings it up a little bit. So if you want more information in the shadows. Here's a tree, this is off, and then boom, level five gives more information in the shadows. I don't use it all the time, but when I just need a little bit of information, here's level five, and then we're gonna go to zero or off. Um, here's another example of a light, or I was gonna say lifeguard a uh, referee, this is off, and then boom, it's at level five. And if you look at her pants um, close up, uh, you can see the difference between off and level five. Here's DRO off, 
and here it is at level five. So you can see it just raises those shadows just a little bit. Now if you're in a situation like this, this particular one where um, I'm actually changing it from uh, off to level five, off to level five, um, back and forth, you're not seeing anything change. Well, in one of these distance shots, um, what happens is those trees, and the way I have it exposed, it's just too bright. There's nothing happening um, to the image at all because there's that 20 or 30 IRE is really not shown here. Even though there, you might think there's blacks in those trees up against the mountains, I'm no meteorologist, but the way air dissipates over distance or something like that, I don't know exactly what, but you're getting either haze or something. It's cutting down the contrast, basically, and raising the blacks. So we don't have much in this image to even show that effect, so it won't even affect it. Now, I've used DRO even in higher ISOs. If you expose it right, um, it works really well. Um, so I, I would say just don't shy away from it. Try experimenting with it. It actually works. Um, it's not one of these gimmicky type things. It just gives you a little bump around 20 or 30 IRE and it brings up the shadows just a little bit. Creative style. I'm gonna have a whole chapter on this. I don't wanna to get too much into it because I don't wanna repeat myself. But I'm gonna just basically just show you really quickly. We're on standard right now. And if I cursor over to the right, you can change the contrast, make it more contrasty or less. You can change the saturation or make it less saturated. And the last one is sharpness. Um, you can make it more sharpened or less. And we're gonna to to talk about this in great deal. I'm just gonna step through these really quick. Here's standard, vivid, neutral, clear, deep, light, portrait, landscape, sunset, night scene, autumn leaves, black and white, sepia, standard. Um, once you get to these again, these are kind of repeat. And basically what you can do here is let's say you want to compare two of them. Um, and I want to compare standard to autumn and have them right next to each other. And I can switch between the two and say, you know, I like that one a little bit better. You know, when you're looking at it through the uh, EVF or on the monitor. Um, you can cursor between the two and get an idea of which one you want to use. Going to page six, uh, we have picture effect. I never want to use the word gimmick. Um, this is a little bit gimmicky and we don't get all the different effects. Let me just show you. You'll understand it once I step through it. Right now, picture effect is off and you've got toy camera, got pop, um, you got the posterization color. I don't know when I'd ever use that. Um, retro photo. Uh, looks like this one says soft high key, um, partial color red, high contrast mono, uh, soft focus mid, HDR painting mid. Um, once you get to these, actually see they're grayed out. See it's doing absolutely nothing. That is, those are, unfortunately you can't use these here. You can always use them in the stills mode. What I'd say here is if you, if there is a look that you're going for or like that and you don't want to want to do it in post-processing, you want to have this weird maybe like look that you're on Mars or something like that, you could definitely use this and then you wouldn't have to do any post-processing. But for the most part, I always leave that off. Picture profile. This is where we're going to get more advanced later. Um, I mean, I could kind of step through these, but I've actually altered these. Um, you can go in and change them. Let me just show you. So if you cursor it to the right when you're on PP1, and then you can go in and you can change the black level. You can change the uh, the gamma curve. Um, again, this is going to be a very advanced um, chapter when we get to it. Um, you can change all these different things in here. The black level, the knee, the, the color mode, the saturation, the color phase, uh, the color depth, detail. We're going to talk all about this um, much later in great detail. Zoom. I really can't um, demonstrate this until later because there's a lot of different zooms that you can use on the camera. So I might just like explain this later and I'm, we're just gonna skip it for now. Focus magnifier. This is a great tool for manually focusing on something so we can punch in. Um, we've assigned this already or it's default signed uh, to the C1 button. So I'm gonna actually get out of here. I'm gonna use the C1 button. I'll press it once, here comes the box. I can move the box around, but I'm gonna just keep it on those tree branches for right now. Then it punches in, you'll see in the upper left-hand corner it says X4.0, so it's a four times zoom basically, or it's, it's punched in four times. And we can see the tree branches and we can go ahead and adjust the focus from there. Now, what I wanna show you now is um, we're gonna to switch to out of movie mode into stills mode. All right, we're in M mode on the dial, and if I press the C1 button, it brings up the box, I press it again. You'll notice this time, it has gone to a 5X multiplication. And if we press it again, 
it now goes to 12.5. We've gone really close. So now I can really get some critical focus on those tree branches and get it just right in there where, you know, where I want it to be. We need to start talking about APS-C versus full frame a little bit. I'm going to get into more later, but right now I'm in the full frame mode, so I'm using the tire sensor. Um, when we got to APS-C, our Super 35, uh, those numbers, those dude numbers are going to change. So right now they were like 5 and 12.5x. When you go into the crop mode or Super 35, you don't get as much magnification. Um, you go from a 3.3 to an 8.1. So we're not going to be able to zoom in as much. Long exposure noise reduction. If you're doing like a night time lapse of the stars, um, you might want to turn this off because if it's on, and let's say your um, shutter is open for 10 seconds, a lot of times what will happen is if this is turned on, this long exposure noise reduction, it'll take 10 seconds for it to process the image. And then you can be able to shoot the next picture. So if you're doing time lapses, you want to keep it open. The shutter closes, it opens again. Um, you want that to happen immediately after. So you're going to have to do your noise reduction in post for like a night time lapse. So I would leave that off. Next one is high ISO noise reduction. You've got normal, low, and off. Um, I usually just leave it on normal. And this has nothing to do with video. Even though we're in video mode right now and I can get to this menu, I've done lots of tests on this and I couldn't see any difference with you when, when I'm shooting video having this on normal versus off. So this must be only a stills related item, which as you can see, there's a uh, symbol next to it with an icon with the mountains in it. So it's saying this is only stills related. Center lock on autofocus. Best way to describe this is to show you how it works. So I'm going to place this uh, white square right in the center on my divider of my sliding glass door. I'm going to hit this center select button and you can see all of a sudden it drew a shape around that and as I move the camera side to side it tracks as I move the camera in or move it out it tracks as well. So it's locking on focus and it's tracking that particular object. Most stuff that I do, um, things that I track are usually people and with faces. Um, if you're into tracking actual objects you might use this. Um, now, if you use the any sort of the zoom, the clear zoom or digital zoom, this won't work in those modes. It will work in APS-C mode or crop mode. Um, it will work in full frame. But um, again, this is not something I use that often. Um, maybe the type of shooting that you do, you track certain objects and you want to keep them in focus. But for me, I don't do it that way. All right, next up is smile face detect. You can have this off. You can register faces. You can turn this on. And if you're in photography mode, you can actually have it uh, take a picture when somebody's smiling. All right, I'm on the A7R2 now. Not the A7S, but the A7R2, and I've got face detect turned on, and you can see there's a white box around my face. If you have a gray box, it means you're probably in manual focus, and it's detecting your face, but it's not autofocusing. And as you can see, it's autofocusing at f1.8 quite well. I mean, the depth of field at f1.8 at this distance is probably about that big. If I was in manual focus right now and I moved just that much, I'd be in and out of focus. So the, if the box is, let's say, green, it's usually acquiring focus and you have multiple people in the frame and it's showing you which one it's acquiring on. If you've registered faces like a bride, number one, groom, number two, maid of honor, number three, it's going to take the bride and it's probably going to put a green box around that. The other two will probably have a magenta, kind of a purple box, I guess you could say. Um, if the bride should leave the frame, the next one in line, the priority would be the groom, um, he would go green. And then the maid of honor would still be purple. Now, if, obviously, if he left the frame, then she would turn green. So there's lots of different colors. Let me, let me demonstrate in terms of the, <clears throat> the size of the box that you see here. You want it to be a fairly good size. It doesn't matter how far away you are from the camera. If you're using like a 7200 or 200 millimeters, as long as the, um, the, the size of the box doesn't get too small. And let me demonstrate. So I'm going to move back and you can see it's still tracking. It lost me there for a second. Still tracking, still tracking and I'm kind of getting out of the frame right there. But as you can see, it, uh, if you have an actor maybe moving through the scene, it may be not the best thing, or if you have people that are like 
rubbing their nose, it might not be the best thing either. Um, if you're doing an interview, I'll give you a few tips because I've done a few of interviews using this face detect. And basically, if tell the per tell the person to address the camera directly and not to rotate, because if they rotate too much, you can see I just lost it. Um, if I turn, let's see if I can get it to do it this time. You'll see that it'll actually see how it locked onto the window. Even though I'm the closest object and I've got this set to wide, it just said, ah, I don't see anybody. I'm not going to do it. So you've got to tell the person that you're interviewing to direct, address the camera directly and not rotate their head around too much. Also, um, not to play with the glasses because if they reach up and reach for their frame and try to adjust it, it might lose autofocus. Um, and also if they, you know, like they're picking their nose or doing something weird like that. Let's see. It should, yeah, it does. Anyway, those are just a few things. Just tell the person, it's okay to talk with your hands in front of your face. Um, yeah, I've got this set on normal speed and normal sensitivity. And as you can see, that's not a problem. Talking with hands is not an issue. And you can see it's not grabbing my hand until I put it in front of my face. So fantastic tool. Um, definitely play with it. Use an interview if you like. Just tell the person that you're interviewing not to like, you know, do a whole bunch of stuff with their hands up against their face. And we're going to demonstrate more about this later in the focus chapter. Working our way down, we have soft skin effect. Um, this is photography only. We'll make a side note that on my A7S, I've actually got that to activate through the Shogun somehow, oddly. Talked to Sony about it. Um, hopefully it's fixed in the A7R2. I haven't had it do that yet, so hopefully it's not an issue. But photography only. Uh, auto object framing, that's photography. Auto mode, <clears throat> if you turn on the mode dial to fully auto, that green auto location right there, um, you can actually film that way. I don't recommend it. Um, if you purchase this course, I think you're wanting to take it to another level in terms of your filming. Um, and doing it that way, having the camera adjust everything for you is kind of a recipe for disaster. It might work well in some instances, but, and I've tried it several times and I'm like, oh, the image looks pretty decent. But most of the time it's like, ooh, it's going the wrong direction. Um, the next thing is uh, scene selection. You can actually shoot video in scene, the scene mode on here too. Um, again, not something I would recommend doing. Uh, movie. So you have different um, ways to expose um, in movie mode. You can have it in fully manual, which is what I just was shooting in. Um, you can have it in shutter priority, aperture priority, or you can have it in program auto. Again, if you purchase this course, you're wanting to take it to the next level, hopefully. Um, I wouldn't let the camera uh, control your aperture or, or shutter for you um, automatically. I would rather do it all manual. And um, like the only thing that you'd ever really want to give up to the camera is maybe auto ISO in instances where you're going from like a, a dark interior to a bright outside and having it do it for you, like on a gimbal move or something like that is about the only thing I can think of. So I would pretty much always leave this in the M mode. All right, steady shot. You can have this on or off. Steady shot's a great feature. You probably already know about it. Um, basically, the sensor itself kind of moves around. So if you have handheld jitters, maybe you're drinking too much coffee in the morning and your hands are shaking, well, it kind of smooths all that stuff out for you, which is a fantastic feature. I love it. Um, it's made my handheld shooting so much better, especially with primes like this 55 millimeter or the uh, 35 mil. The uh, 10 to 18 has optical steady shot in it, as well as the 7200. I will tell you really quickly, um, you might be confused. You might go into here and see this grayed out. Well, if you do, just go ahead and slide the switch to um, steady shot, uh, turn, it, turn it on basically, and it will work. Um, even though it's, it's all grayed out, the lens will definitely work. So what, you can turn this off. When would you turn it off? Basically, if you're shooting on a tripod and you're shooting an interview, and you're shooting in 4K. Um, all those things can generate heat over time. Um, and I've had it like in 75 degrees Fahrenheit, had the camera just shut off. And sometimes it won't, uh, I've had it close the file correctly and not get corrupted. Um, but I've heard horror stories of other people say that it didn't close the file. And that whole 15 minutes interview, it was just totally lost. So that's one of the, the big flaws with this camera is overheating. Um, one of the things you can do to alleviate that 
is to turn the steady shot off, especially on a tripod where you're doing a long interview. I'm gonna leave it on for now. We're gonna go to steady shot settings. Uh, this 55 mil um, through the metadata going through the pin contacts knows it's 55 mil and it'll do it automatically for you. But let's say, for instance, this was a Canon lens and it was a 50 mil. Well, you just go down here to the uh, focal length and you would just cursor down to 50 mil and you would have it there. Now, I've made the mistake before of having this like set to 200, put a 50 mil on it and you get this kind of weird wobbly kind of sensation. Um, if you ever get that, you'll know why, and just make sure to uh, put in the correct focal length. All right, color space. You can see there's a um, graphic with a mountain in it um, next to color space. This is only relates to photography. You can't go in here and change it to Adobe RGB color space for your movies. It's always sRGB for us movie guys. Moving down, we have auto slow shutter. Um, you could turn this on. So basically what this does is say, when I get in really dark situations and I don't want the ISO to keep bumping up automatically, um, if you're on auto ISO, you can actually tell it to like to pull the shutter speed down. This might work in an interview situation where the person's not moving around much and you don't see a motion blur with their hands. Um, I've tried this, it doesn't work very well. Um, I would stay away from it altogether. Audio recording, so you can turn this on or off, just the way to not allow any audio to pass into the system. Um, another way to do it, like I said before, is if you turn this all the way down, no audio is going to go through. Uh, if I turn this up to 1, that's usually what I use for the VideoMic Pro when I'm on the plus 20 dB setting. And then I usually bring this up to, like I said before, like around 20 when I'm using the internal microphones. Good kind of general place to start. I will tell you, you can actually buy an optional feature. Uh, microphone that has uh, basically preamps built in uh, XLR inputs, um, a, a unit that will actually fit into your hot shoe, which is great if you wanted to run uh, XLR cables long distances. Um, this particular microphone, Rode VideoMic Pro, um, I can only run it about 15-20 feet and after that you'll get into interference problems. So if you want to use an XLR solution, um, you can definitely look at that. I will tell you, I've I run a lot of different tests with it. Um, I think the road sounds better. Um, actually, I, here I'll show you, uh, I'll read a sentence to you um, using the Rode Video Mic Pro and then the other one. Whatever mic you use, you want to get as close to the person talking as possible. Whatever mic you use, you want to get as close to the person talking. Also, I've done tests where I've just stopped talking and I had the exact same gain for this microphone as well as the, the Sony and the Rode Video Mic Pro, the way I've got it set up gain structure wise, um, was quieter. There wasn't as much background hiss. Audio output timing. As you can see, I've got my headphones on and if you're doing an interview and you're sitting next to the camera like I normally do and you're looking at the person and you're monitoring their audio in the interview and you're asking questions, you might want to set this to live because it can be very distracting if you go in here and you set it to lip sync. And now it's really hard for me to talk because I can hear myself like a half second later. It's really difficult. I just went back to live so I can talk faster. So basically, if you're in lip sync, from what I understand, it's actually giving you the information after it's been recorded. So uh, if there is any distortion issues, you're going to hear them. But it, like I said before, a lot of times I leave it live because it's just way too distracting, especially if you have these turned up really loud. Uh, in your headphones, um, it can be very distracting if you're on lip sync. Wind noise reduction, you can have this on or off. Um, if you turn it on, basically it creates a high pass filter, so everything probably around 125 hertz below, all that wind noise rumble that would cross the, the diaphragm of the microphone, creating that kind of noise will get thrown out. I usually leave it off. If you want, you just leave it off, and then later in post, you can create your own high pass filter. All right, memory recall and memory. Uh, we'll go into memory first. You've got one and two. These correspond with the one and two on your mode dial. And then you've got four, I guess you could say software um, memories that you could recall. I, I used to use these um, and let me show you. So basically I've got this set up really well for slow motion. So if I were to move this dial to one and recall it, basically I could be shooting um, in slow motion um, mode uh, quite quickly. I could switch between 4K and slow motion on the dial. Well, I don't use it anymore, and the reason why is that I get so tripped up with uh, autofocus because 
on the mode dial, I shoot between uh, movie and M mode a lot because M mode has a lot of advanced autofocus features that sometimes I like using. Well, what happens is the shortest distance between those two on the mode dial is to go through memories one and two. Well, if you assign those to have something, let's say like autofocus, as you're passing through, you're rotating the dial, and let's say you wanted to shoot in manual in movie mode and shoot in manual in M mode, well, when you pass through those one and two, if those were set up for continuous autofocus, it would assign that. And by the time you got to the from movie mode to M mode, you've gone from shooting in manual focus to autofocus mode, and you might not want that, and it kind of trips you up, and it's just, I wish I could use it for slow motion, but it's just become too much of a hassle. But if you want to, you can assign memories that way and recall them. Um, it's just, to me, it's just a little bit of a bother. Now, I will tell you, if you're in movie mode, you'll see this is grayed out, memory recall. Um, you need to be um, in one of the recalled one and two positions in order to see that. And then you could recall some of the software memories as well. All right, we're on to the next tab. That first tab took like an hour, so we're gonna try to go through the second tab a bit faster, uh, which shouldn't take as long. All right, so first up is Zebra. Um, so you can access Zebra here or go back to shooting. Uh, remember I signed it to the left side of the jog wheel. We can also have it here. Unfortunately, you can't see the zebras because it doesn't produce overlays like peaking zebras and stuff like that over the HMI. Some other cameras do like Canon and Panasonic do, but this one doesn't. So I'm gonna be demonstrating this more in the exposure chapter. But basically this uh, zebras is a exposure tool. You could use it for like setting up green screen to make sure all of the the screen is evenly lit by using zebras, or you can use it as an overexposure tool, um, which we're gonna get more into in the exposure chapter. All right, next up is manual focus assist. As you can see, it's got a icon next to it. It's a, so it's still related only, but we can use it. So I'm gonna, we've got it turned on, and if I rotate the barrel, you'll see that it punches in X 3.3. That would be a different number if I was in full frame mode. Now, if I take my thumb and I press the um, jog wheel centered button, it'll go to 8.1. Press it again, it goes back to 3.3. This only works with E-mount lenses. Um, I used to use this in the beginning. I don't use it anymore. It just got to be so um, distracting. Every time I go to reach for the barrel, it'd be, it would punch in. I'd be like, ah. So I've actually keep this off. Uh, focus magnification time. So you can set this two seconds, five seconds, no limit. So basically, I'm going to set this to two seconds. I'll show you what it does. So if I reach for the barrel, and I take my hand off the barrel, after two seconds, it'll revert back. All right, next up is grid line. So you have a bunch of different options. Uh, rule of thirds, let's go there first. You can see what that looks like. Um, so you got the rule of thirds like this, or you can go to square grid, and you've got more guides to help you pan or whatever you're wanting to try to do. Um, diagonal, uh, plus square grid. Uh, to be honest, I've never used this. I don't know when you'd use it, but the, pretty much the only one I ever use is the rule of thirds. And most of the time, here I'll hit record, is I use it when I'm using, trying to match up the horizon like I got right here, or like say you wanted more of the sky, you could do more something like this. And that's pretty much all I ever use it for. All right, next up is markers. If we go ahead and turn these on, and we get out of here. Let me actually, I'll hit record as well. Um, you'll see that we've got two sets of white lines. And if I were to like pan and tilt, um, they give you reference to where, if you are going to crop later, you know exactly where you're going to be shooting in terms of the aspect ratio. Let me hit stop here. We'll go back into the menu. And if we go down to the settings, you can see that we had the aspect ratio set for two. 0.35 to 1. Uh, let's go through a couple other things really quick. If we turn on center, we'll see that center marking right in the center of the screen. And if we go back, a few more items. We've got safety zone. I'm not a TV guy, but if you set it to 90%, I'm guessing that box that you see on the outer edge, that is for TV safe items, <laughs> I guess. And the last one is the guide frame. So I guess more of a uh, rule of thirds kind of thing. All right, audio level display, you can have this on or off. I like leaving it on. Um, as you can see, what it does here is the channel one and two, you can see the green um, meter dancing around as I'm talking. You can only use this in movie mode. Unfortunately, when you go to M mode, you won't see this. 
Um, I wish it would cross over to there, but it unfortunately doesn't. Auto review. This should have an icon next to it saying it's still related only um, because basically what this does is if you take a picture, the image will appear for two seconds and you'll go back to live view. Well, when you're in movie mode, you're either in live view or you're recording. So it's always live, I guess you could say. You don't actually ever see when you stop recording, you don't see something appear on the screen like your playback file. It just doesn't happen. So Sony should fix that. All right, display button. We've got uh, monitor, large display, and finder, which is your EVF. I'm going to do the monitor first. And we're going to turn all these different things on. Make sure they're all on. And I'll press enter. Um, so you got this graphical display on the lower right-hand corner. If I... If I move this around my aperture, you'll see I'm going F14, F16. I can see that display um, as well as the text. So I don't really need this one because it's kind of redundant and it really messes up my screen. So I usually turn that off. If I just display again, and we got your text and icons. And the next one is pretty clean, no text and icons. And the next one is the histogram. And we've got our audio level meters. And the next one is our electronic level. That one right there and we cursor back. Now, some things that we're missing here. So if we go back here with the monitor, I had turned this one off. So I'm gonna turn that one off. The one you did not see is where it says for viewfinder. And that only happens when you're in like the M mode, not the movie mode, but the M mode. You'd actually see that up here. Um, sometimes I shoot that way, so I don't really need that kind of information. You see that all that information on there? Um, so I had turned that one off. So next up, we'll go to uh, finder or your EVF. This one, I don't need the graphical display again. Um, I don't need all the display because I've got that up back on the monitor, so I don't really need that. Um, no display, I definitely want that if I want it totally clean. I like to have the level if I'm shooting on a monopod, and I like to have the histogram. So I can't demonstrate this for you because I have to put my eye through it and you won't see it scroll through, but it's basically no image, um, the histogram, or the, the level. All right, peaking level, you can turn this on, high, mid, or low. We're gonna be going through this more in detail later in the focus chapter, um, and I can't really show you this because there's no overlays. If I turn it on, you won't see it. Um, working our way down, we've got peaking color. Um, if I could show it to you, I'll show it to you later, but um, if I could show you, it's gonna show you in red what's got the most contrast or in focus. Um, so let's say, and most of the time I use it in red, but let's say you're filming somebody, I don't know, um, with a red dress and a red background, um, you might want to change it to white so you can actually see some contrast between the dress and what you're trying to focus on. All right, next up is exposure set guide. I would highly recommend turning this off. I'm going to leave it on so I can show you what it is. So when I rotate the, the aperture dial, let's say, you can see this graphic comes up and it's again, it's redundant. I can see the information already on the screen. I don't really need it. It goes away after a couple of seconds. This happens on shutter and ISO as well. Um, it's annoying because and this is why. Watch what happens when I hit display and I go to my histogram. And now when I rotate the dial, you'll see the histogram goes away. And what's the one thing that you want to have on the, on the screen while you're making an exposure change is the histogram. So it's really frustrating. So what you do is go into the menu, turn this off. So now when I make an exposure change, I can make it and you can see the histogram and you can see what's going on. So you don't, the histogram basically doesn't turn off. I would definitely recommend turning this particular feature off. All right, live view display. I would definitely recommend turning this on. I'm gonna turn it off and I'll show you what happens. So look at the image and you can see it's kind of um, contrasty. Um, basically what's happening here is any of the picture profiles, creative styles, white balance, all that kind of stuff doesn't get affected. Um, I don't know why you would ever want to use this really. Um, you basically want to see what you're going to get or see what you're going to record. Um, so this is kind of the opposite of that. So basically what you go in here, you turn this on and this, when I hit record button will be, um, pretty close. And I say that when you're in movie mode and you're in live view and you hit record, it's identical. There's no difference. But here there's a subtle change and, and maybe you can notice it, but watch what happens when I hit record. There's a subtle difference in color, um, maybe contrast just a little bit. So that's something to be aware of when you're shooting in M mode, this is one of the disadvantages. When you go to hit record, the image is gonna look slightly different. All right, display continuous autofocus area. Uh, right now it's off. Let me show you what that looks like. So I'm shooting on my tripod. If I press my shutter halfway down, and I'm in M mode right now, not movie mode. This won't work in um, movie mode. 
press the shutter halfway down, you see it's acquired focus, lower left hand corner, you see that green icon appear. Now if I go back here and I turn this to on, you'll actually see all the little tiny ones dancing around. Um, and that's showing you where it's focusing on. Um, you can leave this on or off, it doesn't really matter um, if you want to see where it's acquiring focus. I typically leave this off. Phase detect area. You have to be on uh, M mode, not movie mode, to see this. Um, so I'm going to turn this off right now and you can look for the viewfinder and you can see there's no box. Basically when you come here, it's just showing you the, the area. There's going to be a box of where I guess those phase detect um, focus points are located. And that's all it is. Um, you won't be able to see this in movie mode and you won't be able to see this in APS-C mode. All right, pre-AF, this is stills related only, but I will tell you, um, I turned this off because I just don't like it focusing before I press the shutter halfway down, um, and, it, and it might drain the battery a little bit. I've never run tests on this, but uh, I, I typically leave this off. All right, zoom settings. So we got three different ones. We got optical, clear, and digital. So optical is the best kind because you don't have you won't degrade your image and these two are both digital type zooms so optical i can't show it to you because i don't have one of those lenses um, maybe they have a rocker switch on them i'm not quite sure um, but you could possibly control it from the back of the camera to zoom in and zoom out i don't know i, I can't really demonstrate it for you unfortunately all right clear and clear image zoom is a 2x zoom and digital zoom is a 4x zoom Clear image zoom doesn't say anything in the manual, but there's a gentleman, uh, Chapman McAllister. He's a Sony expert type person. Um, I watched one video he did. He talked about how clear image zoom actually looks at textures, different types of textures, like whether you're shooting a cat or you're shooting a landscape, and it's going to apply a certain amount of sharpness. Clear image zoom will give you a 2x zoom, and digital zoom will give you a 4x zoom. All right, so in terms of zooms, um, the first piece of advice I can give you. Let's say you walk up to a fence and you got your 7200 and you want to shoot something very far away. Um, the first thing I would tell you to do is shoot in 4K. You get the most resolution that way. Second thing I would tell you is definitely shoot in APS-C mode. That'll crop in and shoot 4K APS-C mode. That'll give you the best image. Um, let's say you need more reach beyond that. Then I would probably use the clear image zoom. And then if you need more image, uh, more reach beyond that, you would use the digital zoom. So let me show you some examples. We're gonna show clear image zoom first. So here I am um, zooming in on this uh, building way off in the distance. And I'm just stepping through all the different numbers all the way up to um, 2X, which should be happening right about there. So that's as, as close as I can get. Now I will tell you, you're gonna see some uh, kind of vibrations and moving around. Um, I haven't figured this out yet. The 7200, um, I had the IBIS or the five axis image stabilization turned on, um, but I was still getting shaking uh, like that. And I would turn it on, turn it off, and it was doing absolutely no difference. I know it works on that particular lens, but the reason why it's shaking, and it's a very, very slight breeze, but even just the slightest bit, and you're zooming in this close, you're gonna get some shake. Um, I still don't know why the five axis image stabilization didn't help in this instance, because I turned it on, turned it off, and I didn't see any difference at all. Um, and this was mounted on a tripod. So if I find out, I'll definitely tell you later in the course. But let's take a look at, um, here's 4K on the left, um, 1080 on the right, both on APS-C mode or Super 35. So you definitely want to shoot in 4K. As you can see, um, it definitely gives you a better image um, shooting in 4K. The next example I want to show you is um, shooting APS-C mode versus shooting full frame mode with a 2x zoom, so they'll become equal. They'll become on par with each other. So let's take a look at that. And as you can see, I would probably pick the APS-C 4K over the full frame with a 2x zoom. Um, to me, it looks like there's more detailed information there. All right, next up, I'm gonna compare the 2x zoom of the clear zoom versus the 2x zoom of the digital zoom. And as you can see, um, there really isn't any difference between the two. All right, next up we're gonna compare the digital zoom. So this is all the way out. Here's at 2X, um, 4K on the left, 1080 on the right. And at the end here, here's 4X zoom, 4K on the left, 1080 on the right. And as you can see, 
the 4K definitely wins when you're zooming in 4X. High Star AF, that is photography, I'm gonna skip it. Uh, Finder monitor is grayed out on mine, you'll be able to see it. The only reason it's grayed out is because I'm recording this with the HDMI. But basically you got three choices, you got auto, you got manual, um, EVF, and manual monitor. So basically auto, you hold the camera up to your eye, um, switches off the main display, be able to see through the EVF. Pull it away, does the opposite. The other ones you can actually force it to only stay on one or the other, like the EVF or just the main display. So let me give you a quick tip. I've learned this over the last 18 months or so with my GH4 and th these type of cameras, is instead of reaching across, because we only have one button on the left-hand side of the camera of as you're looking at it from behind, um, and when you bring your thumb across to reach for the menu button, you're going to pass by that sensor, and it's going to trip the sensor, and it's going to you're going to lose the display all of a sudden. It's kind of I don't know. It, it's kind of a pain sometimes. So basically, what I've learned to do over the last 18 months is not cross my finger this way, but to go like this. It might take a I don't know, a few milliseconds longer to go this way than go like that. Um, but I've learned just to go up and over. And if you do that, you can just leave it on auto all the time. Um, auto is great because it switches back and forth and you're not having to go deep dive into the menu to change it. All right, release without card. You can enable or disable this. If I enable it, that basically means that I can take a picture without a card being in it. Um, if I disable it, which I like to have, that means I can't take any picture um, so I don't want to get this false hope that I'm about to leave to go on a shoot and I've just pressed the shutter. It looked like I had the card in. I go leave for the shoot and to realize I forgot to bring my card with me. Um, so I just leave it disabled just in case for some reason I didn't check the actual to see if there was a card in the card slot. So I would just leave it disabled so you don't get confused and you don't leave home without an SD card. All right, these two priority set are photography only. I don't know why they don't have a little symbol icon next to it saying it's photography only, but it's basically what it does is it won't allow you or you could set it if you want it to be in or out of focus when you press the shutter. So you could tell the camera, I don't want to press the shutter until it's totally in focus. So how does that have anything to do with video? I don't know. So I don't know why Sony doesn't put an icon there to show you it's only stills only. All right, silent shooting. So if yours is grayed out, you need to go to like M mode, not movie mode. You won't see it there. So you can only use this in a picture mode. You can turn this on or off. I typically leave it off. That way it uses the mechanical shutter um, versus the electronic shutter. Electronic shutter is totally silent. It doesn't make any clips, clicks or anything like that. You will still get a lot of beeps on the camera like acquiring focus. Um, I'll show you how to turn those off later. But um, one of the things I thought would be good with it, and that I don't really ever use sunlight shooting. I guess if you're a street photographer, you might want to use it. But there's a few things you have to consider. One, you're going to get rolling shutter um, issues um, or something passes by like a truck in front of your frame very quickly. The truck's going to be skewed because of rolling shutter. Um, now, if you're using this for maybe a time lapse at night, and I've never done this, so I don't know if it'll work or not, but a lot of times when I'm camping with my girls, I like to set the camera up outside the tent, not too far away, and just let it go. And it usually takes a picture every 30 seconds, and it gets the stars going by at night. Now, I have never tried this. I don't know if it'll work well in silent mode, um, but that might be something it would be great for. Now, there's a few other things you have to worry about using silent mode for time lapses is the picture profiles and I believe the um, if you're like you're wanting to use like for instance a uh, um, like a picture profile or creative style it won't apply that effect to the image at all. All right e-front curtain shutter um, stills only. Uh, this auto imaging extract this is also stills only and I don't think it really pertains to time lapse too much because the only way you can use this is if you're on the auto on the the mode dial and I never shoot that way so um, we're gonna skip it. Uh, reset EV comp this is photography only but I'm gonna mention one thing really quickly with this you can actually um, have this reset every time I believe you turn the camera on and later on I'll actually um, assign to this rear dial not the exposure compensation dial but the rear dial to be exposure compensation it's just a lot easier to reach to um, and so what happens is every time I 
I reset the camera, I can use this dial instead of the top dial because the top dial has numbers on it. And then if you go to like plus three, for instance, you turn the camera off, turn it back on again, well, it's still gonna be at plus three. So um, I just find it easier to use the rear dial on this one. All right, face registration. So I'm gonna have a whole chapter on focus. I'm gonna demo this later. It's a pretty powerful tool. So if you have a bride, a groom, you can register their um, faces. Or let's say you have a reporter on the street and it's a crowded street and you just want him to focus just on this guy as he's coming towards you. You could just register just his face and it'll take his face as he walks towards the camera and constantly autofocus with him. So again, I'm gonna demo this later. APS-C Super 35. I know I've talked about these terms already, um, so let's get into it. Um, if you turn this off, basically what happens is we use the entire sensor, everything on it. So let's talk about stills for a second. If we're using the entire sensor, we're getting all 42 megapixels. If I go ahead and I go in here and I turn it on, I'm using less of the sensor, and we're only using, I believe, around 18 megapixels. If we go into here and we turn this off, let's talk about using the full frame. Um, so this 35 millimeter on a, in this mode is 35. If I were to go and change this to APS-C, then we'd have to multiply 35 times 1.5, we get around 50 millimeters. So this lens becomes more of an equivalent of 50 millimeters when you're shooting in APS-C mode. So there are pros and cons for shooting with each. Um, let's talk about full frame. Full frame, if you're in a low light situation and it's getting really dark and you're starting to pump that ISO to like 6400, you're gonna get a lot more noise than you do in APS-C mode. So in those instances, I would definitely recommend reaching for a wire lens, whatever you need to do, and shoot in APS-C mode because you'll get a much cleaner image. The next thing, uh, if you're shooting in full frame mode, you're gonna get more rolling shutter. Um, basically rolling shutter, let me demonstrate this, the difference between the two. You're gonna see here, as I whip the camera around left and right really quickly, you're gonna see that the full frame has less rolling shutter than APS-C mode. So if you're doing like say action, sports, um, you're doing an action scene and you're running around handheld and you don't wanna get a lot of jello, you might definitely want to shoot in the full frame mode. Now, if you're shooting in APS-C mode, um, the biggest thing I love about that is that's what this camera is designed to do for video. And you will get very, very little, if any, aliasing or more artifacts that happen within the shot that can cause kind of like interference. Um, especially you have tight patterns. Sometimes even like a mesh shirt can do it. If you get razor sharp focus just right on the shirt and you're in full frame mode, you can, because it's pixel bending and it's, um, it's not a full pixel readout on the full frame sensor, weird things start to happen in terms of aliasing and more. So, um, if you're like shooting a corporate CEO type person interview, you, and it, sometimes it's almost impossible to see if you're getting Alice Gamora with the EVF or the display, or even sometimes on my like large seven inch display on my Shogun, you, sometimes you can't see it until you get to post-production and then you look at it like at your 1080 image or 4K image and you're like, oh, it's got aliasing. Oh, it's got more issues. And that can be a real bummer. So if you're doing those type of things where you have lots of textures in the shot, even like, I mean, I've been fooled thinking, oh, I'm, I'm free and clear of any textures like sand. Um, I've gotten uh, aliasing or more patterns developing just on sand, if you can believe that. So this has really replaced my GH4, my Panasonic GH4 camera, because I always like having a full frame camera and a crop sensor camera. This is kind of my crop sensor camera for video, because most of the time I'm shooting in APS-C mode when I need to, because um, it gives me the cleanest image, not only in terms of noise, but free of aliasing and more, or almost free of aliasing. You might sometimes get a little bit, but if you go to full frame mode, um, you get the one benefit of less rolling shutter, which is not a big thing for me because I don't do much like action movies or anything like that. Um, so I would advise using APS-C as much as you can um, if you wanna get the cleanest images. Autofocus micro adjustment. Um, I don't own any um, lens adapters uh, for the A mount, uh, the LAEA2, LAEA4. I don't own any of those, so I really can't demonstrate this. I don't want this to be a cop-out, but um, basically what it allows you to do, from my understanding, is you can micro-adjust, um, get the focus just right for each individual lens. So I guess if you're having a problem with maybe the adapter or the A, 
uh, mount lens, you can fix it that way. All right, lens compensation. So you've got three different things that you can have the camera fix with a Sony lens on it. This won't work for like a Canon lens or anything like that. So shading is the basically vignetting, darkening around the corners, so you can have that corrected in camera, which is kind of nice. So you don't have to do this stuff in post. It just gets it done in camera and does a good job at it. Let me show you an example of, here's vignetting correction turned on, and it's you, know, you can see in the corners looks good, and then venue, uh, vignetting correction is turned off, and you can see there's a darkening around the corner. So I would definitely leave this on auto if you have FE lenses like I do, and just let it fix it for you because um, it's much harder to do this type, type of stuff in post. Um, you just don't have to worry about it. Now, chromatic aberration, I've done this test, um, and I could not see a difference. Here's chromatic aberration correction on, and here's chromatic aberration correction off. And as you can see, I couldn't tell any difference, because you can see some purple fringing happening around that tree branch. Um, it corrects it in terms of the uh, stills, but I couldn't see any correction happening on the video side of things. And the same thing with distortion compensation. Um, I couldn't see it correcting like a wide angle uh, lens distortion or anything like that, um, fixing the barrel distortion. So uh, I would say leave these on all auto and that way you don't have to deal with some of the stuff in post. It just makes things a lot easier in post. All right, next up is AF system. I believe this only has to do with A-mounted lenses and the adapters. And basically it sets the focus detection system for phase detection versus contrast autofocus. Um, unfortunately, I can't do it with any lenses because I don't own any uh, A-mount lenses. All right, video light mode. Um, I can't really demonstrate this because here I'll put a model number below me of one you can buy from Sony and it'll fit in this multi-pin hot shoe right here. Um, I wouldn't recommend putting an LED right on the camera like this. I mean, I guess you can if you're doing like news gathering, but it doesn't give the most flattering light on somebody's face. You might want to move that light off camera a bit. Um, and then if you're going to do that, you might as well buy a uh, less expensive LED because this one that I'm putting down below, um, I think it comes in around $600 or something ridiculous. So I personally wouldn't use this at all, but basically this allows you to like have the the light turn on when you're recording or in a bunch of different scenarios. So again, sorry, I can't demonstrate this. All right, function menu set and custom key settings. We've already talked about this. Um, this basically allows you to sign all the different things, uh, the, the function buttons, the, the custom buttons on the camera so you can move and shoot much quicker. Uh, again, these are all my settings. If you have a different shooting style, if you shoot documentaries or you shoot news gathering or you shoot whatever, you shoot short films, this might look totally different. Dial EV compensation, this is photography only. I just got this set to the rear so I can control the um, exposure compensation from the rear dial instead of on the top. Zoom ring rotate, as you can see, I don't have any lenses that um, will work with this, but yeah, I believe you have the 28 to 135. You can actually, it's a power zoom and you can actually flip the way it zooms. So I guess if you're coming from like a Nikon and you're used to it rotating a certain direction, well, you can switch it around so it rotates the opposite way. Um, again, I can't demonstrate this. Movie button. If you have this select to always, it doesn't matter if you're in stills mode or movie mode, it'll work. But if you choose the other, then you won't be able to shoot when you're in a stills mode. All right, dial wheel lock. Um, so basically you can lock all the, um, the dials and wheels on the camera if you bump them a lot. So basically how you do this, you go up, you press lock, you press the FN button for about three seconds. I can't demonstrate this because I got the HDMI connected, but basically a screen will appear and at just one word, it'll say locked. And then you can, you can change white balance, you can do all the other stuff, but you can't change any of the wheels or dials. So they won't move if you're used to bumping them. I never turn this on to be honest. And to unlock it, you do the opposite. You press and hold the function button for about three seconds and you'll see a little message that says unlocked and you're ready to go again. All right, that brings us up to the wireless tab. So let me take a break just for a quick second here. Um, what I've been doing is as I shoot these, um, I'm editing them at the same time. So I actually know this particular chapter on menus is already about an hour and a half long. Um, and it's getting kind of long. So I, the, like I said before, this wireless tab and the apps tab, um, I'm gonna breeze through quite quickly. Don't worry, there's gonna be some items I'm gonna definitely talk about and slow down. But like I said before, I don't wanna make this course like 11 hours long, cause we're gonna get, I mean, cause if I were to get into Mac addresses and all the troubleshooting you'd have to do to, to make this work, 
Um, like if you're on a fashion shoot and you wanted to use this camera to transfer images, or if you're in a war zone and you want to transfer your MP4s uh, to your smartphone for news gathering and stuff like that, this would take um, maybe just an hour in itself. So I want to breeze through this quite quickly. So let's get started. Send a smartphone or send a computer. Let's say you're out in a war zone, like I said before, and you need to get the coverage to your editor. Well, you can only send MP4. You can't do AVCHD or XAVCS. So you transfer it to your phone or your laptop, and then from there you would email it to your editor or whatever. Um, not gonna spend too much time on that. View on TV. Um, basically, you need a special TV. I think it's a DLNA, something like that. I don't have one of those like Sony TVs or whatever, so I can't really demonstrate that. Um, one touch NFC, like I said before, my iPhone has NFC. I can't demonstrate it because it doesn't allow this particular app. Maybe it will in the future, but if you have an Android phone, you can put it up to the side of the device um, and then you can allow that transfer to happen. All right, airplane mode. So I think there's a lot of misinformation on the internet of people that will do something and that feels like they get more battery life and they'll claim, oh, I got 10 to 20% more battery life and they never ran a test. Well, I've run tests not only on this camera, but the A7S uh, with airplane mode on versus off. So basically, basically it's just turning the wireless function off. Um, so you might think there's an antenna in there that's constantly receiving signal and it's draining the battery more because it's looking or pulling for uh, another device out there. So basically I've run tests and I can tell you it doesn't make any difference whatsoever on the battery. And there's only one place in the bat in the manual it talks about savoring, saving uh, battery, um, in terms of battery consumption. Um, and that's where it talks about the display quality, which we'll get to later. Um, so the test that I've run, like on the A7S that I'm recording with now, I got an hour and 37 minutes and there was only 30 seconds difference between having it on or off. And I would call that pretty much a tie. And in this camera, it was even closer. The on and off difference was only off by three seconds. This one operated for two hours and 18 minutes. And basically what I did, turn the camera on, hit record. It recorded for its 30, 30 minutes time period. It stopped recording. I just left it on and I ran a time lapse of when the, the actual camera turned off. And I just looked at the time and I did this test for both of them. And this one only had a three second difference. To me, that's an utter tie. There's absolutely no power consumption difference by putting it into airplane mode. All right, WPS push. I don't have one of these type of routers, but basically if you have a router that has some sort of button that allows you to set this up, again, I'm just gonna skip this because my router doesn't have this. Um, access point set, this is where you actually go in. I'm not gonna press it because you'll see all my Wi-Fi stuff that I've got going on in my house, but basically you find it, uh, find the your access point, you enter your password, and then you'll be able to connect. And the reason that you wanna be able to connect to this, um, the camera to your Wi-Fi, is you can go into the App Store and download an app like the Time Lapse app. Edit device name, this is where I go in and I set, I usually call it the name of the camera plus Dave, or if you have multiple cameras, maybe you call it you know, A7R2, dash two or camera A, camera B or something like that. So when you bring up your Wi-Fi on your iPhone or Android, you'll actually see it there and you'll know which one to connect to. Display Mac address it does exactly what it says. Um, you can reset the uh, password and then you can reset like the whole network setup. All right, we did the wireless fast and then we're gonna do the applications fast. Here we go, application list. So if you go into the application list, um, you'll see three different things. You can do like application management, sort it and all that stuff. But basically I wanna talk about two different things. That's the smart remote enabled. So if I go ahead and press this, um, you'll see the play memories thing come up. What you wanna do is download um, your play memories app on here. It's free in the app store, just download it. And then then go into your Wi-Fi of your, your smartphone and then you'll find a device, we'll call it something like DirectX, and then it'll have their name like A7R Mark II Dave. Yeah, in fact, you can actually see the device name, but it'll have something, yeah, it says DirectX FEO. You'll see that on there. You wanna choose that as your device, go into the app, then you'll be able to control it. So you'll be able to do stuff, it's really cool. You can like change your exposure by changing your aperture, your ISO, you can change your white balance, make sure you're in focus, and then you can actually hit record, start recording, put it down, record yourself, hit stop. I personally don't use it. I used to use it a lot. Um, and then I just got this very simple remote I bought on eBay 
for like used for like I don't know seven or eight bucks. This is really cheap. It's the RMT845. What's great about this one is it got a little um, like I've talked about before the time code reset. So if I have two cameras, I can hit that the IR blast them both at the same time and they'll hopefully sync up the time code at the same time. So that's pretty much it for this particular app. What I want to tell you before. Um, and I don't know if the firmware is it has definitely been updated on this camera, but back when I had the Comlight and the Metabones adapter on here, and I would go into applications like the time lapse or even this application, um, you want to make sure if something starts acting wonky, just go ahead and exit the application, um, and then your camera will start performing normally. But I have tell I have lost good time lapses because of like those third-party adapters like Comlight or Metabones. Um, when you go into applications, things can act really funky. Now, hopefully those things have been addressed. I don't have those adapters anymore. I can't test it anymore, but um, that's the reason why I've gone all FE lenses is I don't have to worry about that. These just work with the camera, with the apps. It's great. All right, next up is our play menu. And I want to mention one thing really quickly. To get to the play menu quickly, and you'll notice it's kind of weird because most of the time it'll leave where you left off. But if you were to hit play, um, and then I were to hit menu, You'll notice that I used to be like in the first tab, now I'm all the way to the play tab. So it thinks, well, it must want you there. So it's a little frustrating sometimes because I'd rather it leave where I left off, but it doesn't do that all the time. So if you're wondering why it's shifting over, it's, it's thinking that you want to be on the play menu. So first one is delete. Um, you can delete all with this date. You, would you like to do it for December 1st, 2015? You could say, okay, and you could get rid of all of them. I'm gonna hit cancel um, or you can delete multiple images. You'll see a little check mark. So you're gonna hit the select button and you can see the check mark appears, check mark appears, check mark appears. And then you, see, you hit the end menu button and they say, would you like to delete these three images? You say, okay. All right, view mode next. So you can do it by date, folder, uh, AVC HD, you know, all the different types here. Um, date view if i select this you can see it's on the calendar um so you can go back in time and if you're on vacation or something like that you can see the the date and you can just pull those up which could be kind of handy to be honest i never used it that way um if we go back and we can go to like all the mp4s now i will tell you and we're going to get into folders later but <laughs> the way sony's got their folder structure set up it could be quite confusing finding stuff on the card I'll try to deal with that a little bit later um, to clear up some of that confusion because when you shoot AVC uh, or you shoot MP4 or XAVC, they all end up in different folders. So when you go to find them, it's not that easy. So we're gonna, we'll cover that more later, but this is basically just to view it on the camera. Um, if you wanna do it by date view or however you like, you can view them that way. All right, image index basically just resizes your thumbnails. So let me show you. So you got nine images or 25 images. Nine inches means it's bigger. 25 means you get smaller thumbnails. So let me show you. So here, if I had nine images, you'd see them all stacked up. Let's go back. If I change it to 25, um, you can see it actually got smaller. So it would actually fit 25 on there. Display rotation. This is where I kind of scratch my head again. You can't rotate a video file. So why is there a little icon showing this is a photography only type thing? So we're gonna skip it. All right, next up is slideshow. So here you can actually, you know, connect HDMI up to a TV. Let's say you're on vacation. I've done this before. And the family wants to see what you shot that day, video wise, or you could do stills. Um, you can see there's an interval says three seconds, but when you do actually video, it almost does it seamlessly. So it'll almost like it's, like somebody edited all your material for you and it's just displaying on the TV. And then, so what's cool is, let's say you shot a whole bunch of video, um, it'll play the first clip and it almost seamlessly goes to the next clip. So you're watching on TV. Um, it's kind of a fun way to review footage uh, at the end of the day. Um, I like if you're on a vacation, I don't know if you do it on a business type thing. Maybe if a bunch of clients are sitting in the room, they're like, yeah, you can delete that clip. We don't need that one. Yes, we want to use that one. Maybe they're writing notes. Um, so it's a good way to uh, review footage after you've shot it. Okay, rotate. This is uh, photography only. Um, we'll skip it. All right, enlarge image. This is like your C3 button, your custom button when you're in playback mode. Um, you can zoom in on photos, but you can't do it with uh, video. It won't let you. It says unable to magnify. All right, protect. So this is where you can protect images from getting erased accidentally. But I, I format my card, so um, if you format the card, it doesn't matter if these are rate protected or not, it'll get erased. So 
I never use this. Uh, specify printing, um, you can't print a video, so this is photography only. All right, we're up to the last tab. So we got monitor brightness. It's grayed out because I've got the HDMI connected right now. But basically it's got an auto or what they call sunny weather. <laughs> I don't know why they just don't call it auto because that's basically what it does. It changes the brightness of the screen, your display, um, according to the, the light in the room. There's two trains of thought on this. Um, if you're outdoors, you want it to be brighter so you can see it better. But to be, be honest with you, I don't have it change. I like to have it just one brightness level and that's right at zero all the time. And then it doesn't mess up my exposure. Cause I noticed with my iPhone and I have it on auto brightness, um, I might be watching a video at night um, in a dark room. Well, it brings the brightness all the way down and it things just don't look right. It's this auto brightness type stuff um, can be a little bit confusing. So when you're setting exposure, you don't want to be confused. So I just leave it at default zero setting in terms of brightness. If you do increase it, you are going to zap um, your battery life. Um, another thing is the next one down is your viewfinder or EVF. When you, It's going to ask you to look through it. This one I do change. I change it to plus one and I just leave it at plus one all the time. Um, finder color temperature. Um, I leave this at its default color temperature. I don't want it to be warmer or cooler or anything like that. I just want it to always be the, exactly the same. If you start messing with that, then you're going to start messing with your white balance to compensate for it and it could just make it very confusing. All right, volume settings. So you can go in here and actually change how loud the speaker is. It doesn't change the beep at all, if that's what you're thinking. It's only the speaker, so if you're playing back a video file. Um, you don't want to deep dive into the menu to be able to change this. So basically when you're in playback mode, you want to hit the down and, and around the cursor, uh, the jog wheel, you want to hit the down one. It'll give you access to basically what you see right here is the volume setting and you can increase it or decrease it. All right, audio signals. Um, you can turn this on or off. I leave it on mostly. Now, if you're shooting in movie mode and you're using autofocus, if you press the shutter halfway down, you'll see the green boxes appear saying that you've acquired focus but you won't hear anything if you go into one of like m mode one of the photography modes and you press the shutter halfway down to acquire focus you will hear a confirmation beep let's say if you're at a wedding you don't want to hear that you can definitely go here turn it off if you want to be totally silent shooting you would want to turn audio signals off and go to the um, silent mode or electronic shutter um, and then this camera becomes totally silent all right next up is mode dial guide um, this might be helpful when you first get the camera and you change the mode dial. You'll see something appear on the right hand side of the screen. It's kind of curved. It's got a whole bunch of junk on it and tells you what mode you're in. Um, after a while it gets very annoying quite quickly. So I would just turn that off. Um, so as you're moving the mode dial, you won't see that up here. All right, delete confirmation. Um, if you're living on the edge, put it on the top one. Um, basically what happens when you hit the delete button, you'll have two boxes appear. One's delete and the other one's cancel. Um, if you want it to come up with cancel highlighted, um, do that and then you'll have to go up and then delete. Um, typically what I do on video shoots, corporate stuff, I never delete anything. Just don't do it. It's just it's too risky. Um, and then, so for what, you know, when I do delete, I usually have delete first and I can delete through stuff much quicker. So I'm on a family vacation or something like that. I was like, yeah, just delete, 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 bad, bad photo or whatever. It just saves a little bit of time having to cursor up and then hit delete. All right, display quality. I set this to high because I want the best resolution I can when I'm looking at the image on the camera. Um, you can set this to standard and this is where it does talk in the manual where you can save battery life. I have never tested this. I don't know what the percentage is. If you saved 15 or 20%, I don't know. I've never tested it, but the manual says you can save battery here. I never do this because I want to see the, the highest quality image I can. Now there is some confusion on the internet. Um, I read some in place in the forums about, oh, it's changing the refresh rate from 24 to 60. Um, and I asked Sony about it and the person that came back from Sony seemed quite knowledgeable said no, has nothing to do with refresh rate. All it does is it changes the resolution from a high resolution to, and the standard has a, um, a lesser resolution basically. Power, save, start time. So you can set this to whatever you want. So basically if you want it to be five minutes, so after the camera's been on for five minutes, it will go into power save mode. Um, like I talked about before, I'm using this remote control and we're going to get to this later in the next tab over or the next menu over where um, if you turn the remote control capability of the camera on, the camera never shuts off. So it doesn't matter if you have to set to 10 seconds or whatever, um, it's always going to stay on continuously. It doesn't talk about that in the manual. It's not one of those little 
asterisk type things in the manual. I just had to learn that on my own. All right, NTSC and PAL selector. Um, it requires a reboot if you need to do this. Um, probably when it got shipped to your country, let's say you're in Europe, it was probably shipped in the default of PAL. Um, if you're in North America, it's probably NTSC. That's the way my camera was shipped. Um, so basically, when we were going through frame rates um, in, at the beginning of this chapter, and we we're talking about 60 frames per second or 120 frames per second, if you go to PAL, those numbers change slightly. So instead of 50 frames per second, I guess you get 50 frames per second instead of 60, you get 100 frames per second instead of 120. So if you're wanting to over crank the camera and get a bit more slow motion, uh, depending on your lighting situation and all that stuff, maybe you're outdoors and there's no lights involved, um, switch over to NTC, you can over crank a little bit more and then go back to PAL if you're shooting indoors or whatever you're doing. So. Um, Select it based off of the country you're in and you pretty much only have to set it once and you really don't have to worry about after that. All right, cleaning mode. So I had asked Sony on this one because I don't think it was really written in the manual very well. Um, I said with the Canon cameras I've had before, it would shake the sensor basically um, when you turn it on and turn it off to shake off any dust that might be on it when maybe when you change the lens. Um, and I asked them and he, and he wrote back and he said, yes, um, the, the sensor has a charge protection coating and does a high frequency ultrasonic vibration every time the camera is turned off. It also does an electronic discharge to get rid of any dust. And there's apparently he talks about a sticky strip below the sensor to catch any of the dust. Um, so it does it automatically, but if you want to do it manually, you can do it here as well. And you want to follow the procedures. All right, demo mode, this is basically for stores. Um, you have to be plugged in with the USB adapter for this to even be highlighted. I don't know exactly what it does. I've never tried it. Um, but I, it's just basically for stores to be able to demonstrate how the camera works. All right, TCUB settings. That stands for time code and user bit. Right off the bat, I'm going to tell you I am no expert on this. I'm going to tell you how I use it. Uh, most of the time, I have this set on counter. And basically, in the lower left-hand corner of the screen, when you hit record, you're going to see minutes and seconds count up, which is, can, you know, very useful. You know how long you've been recording. But if you want to do it in terms like a multi-camera shoot, let's say you're in a studio environment or... Last time I used this was for a volleyball game. I set the two cameras up side by side and I took this one button right here. It says time code reset and I hit it. And it basically resets both cameras time code back down to zero. Now it's not perfect with this IR blaster type way of jam syncing. It's always like a frame or two off. Sometimes you'll get it perfect. And the reason I say that is because you have pretty much have to set two cameras up next to each other and take a picture of them with your iPhone and look at the time code because it's going by so fast, you can't scan back and forth with your eye. There's just no way. And it's usually like a frame off or sometimes it's on or it's two frames off, but it's close enough. Basically, what I'll do is I'll shoot like this volleyball game. I had one master camera on the whole entire court and then another camera I was getting close ups of the players and stuff like that. So I take all that footage and I bring it into the um, nonlinear editor. And a lot of times you could do this with audio, but sometimes when you have crowd noise or the two microphones are very distant from each other, um, it's really hard for the audio to sync up. So with time code in a big gym environment like that, you just lasso all around all of them like in Premiere Pro and you say sync by time code. And then magically, you got the master track of the like the A camera that's shooting the wide shot, and then all of the little you know close-ups up here because they're like all these start and stop um, clips that I did, and they're all magically just appear on the timeline. A lot of times I'll have to finesse it a little bit, like a frame this way or frame that way to make it perfect, but um, audio just doesn't work well like in a gymnasium environment like that. So using jam syncing this way um, actually kind of works. So um, if you set it on time code. And then you could just, I would leave these all at zero, to be honest, I don't know why. Some people actually will change the hours and stuff like that. They have different methods, different methodologies in studios and stuff like that. I've heard people like, well, I'm gonna start this camera on hour one, this one on hour two, and then I'll know how to do it. And so I, again, I'm no expert on this. I don't even know why TC format is um, grayed out. In the manual, it just says TC format sets the recording method for the time code, whatever that means. Time code run. I usually set this on free run. Like I talked about, you can start and stop like that close up camera for the volleyball players. When I start and stop, the time code just keeps running. So 
if I start it up 15 seconds later, it uh, time code will be 15 seconds later. So when I sync it up, like I talked about, it'll all line up perfectly. Moving down, and TC Make, I don't know what this exactly is. It just says sets the recording format for the time code on the recording medium. Again, whatever that means. Uh, again, I'm really no expert here. This page two, user bit, I don't even know what user bit is. So this is, I think a step beyond, I think most people I could talk about before will just use um, audio sync. So if you're doing dual sync sound with two cameras or three cameras, you're just gonna sync it up with the audio. But like the example I gave before, when you're in a loud gymnasium, you have crowd noise, um, it's sometimes really hard for a program like Pluralize or even Premiere Pro to sync all that stuff up in post. All right, remote control, you can turn this on and off. Um, again, this is the, the one I use. And like I said before, I just wanna reiterate, if you turn this on, the camera will not go into power savings mode. All right, HDMI settings. So starting at the top, we have HDMI resolution. I usually set this on auto because the cable to like the Shogun I'm recording with is usually intelligent enough to know what's being recorded um, or what's coming out of the HDMI. So if you're sh shooting 4K, it's gonna output 4K. And I usually just leave it on auto and it works fine. I don't know why you'd ever use 1080i. That just seems weird. Don't use interlaced bad. <laughs> anyway, going down, you can choose between 24p and 60p on your output. Um, HDMI info display. So all this stuff that you're seeing me do right now, um, showing the menus, showing stuff, uh, all the icons and the f-stops and all that stuff, histograms, all those overlays. Um, I guess you call it a dirty image, not a clean output on the HDMI. Um, that's turned on. So I can show that stuff to you. But if you're going to be shooting, I think most of you guys would go in here and turn this off. All right, time code output. You can have this off or on. It sends the time code over the HDMI signal to your recorder, basically. You need to turn this on, and I say need to, because I'll explain here in a second, if you want to see the next menu item, which is rec control. Um, so if you want to turn this one, you can turn this one on, and basically what you have to do, and this is what it says in the manual, um, but I can't get this to work, and I just watched Jeremy Young from Atomus do a demonstration on how to make this work. Or when you hit the record button on the camera, it triggers the record on the Shogun. But I can't seem to get it for, to work. I watched him do it for the A7S. I know that works, but the A7R 2 it doesn't work. If you're watching this, it means I've tried to contact Atomus, but I haven't gotten an answer back and try to figure out what's going on here. So um, I'll try to find out, but if you're watching this, that means I probably haven't found out yet. All right, this last one says control for HDMI. Um, you can turn this on or off. I usually just leave it off because I don't have a Bravada or Sony Bravada TV sync enabled uh, TV. I can't demonstrate this. I've never tried it. Basically, what I understand from the manual is you can aim your Bravada TV remote control at the TV and have your camera connected to the TV via the HDMI and it'll take the signal from the TV through the HDMI back to the camera and you can start and stop um, playing or fast forwarding maybe, I don't know. I, I've never tested it. All right, next up is 4K output select. You can um, record to the memory card and out to the HDMI or these other two options are HDMI only so it's not recording to the card. All right, USB connection. So I've tried auto and mass storage and I've had no problem transferring files from the camera to the computer. Again, it's not something you want to do because it's a very slow speed. Um, and I'm on a Windows machine. Um, if you are on a Macintosh or perhaps you're doing a, a tethering type session, um, you might try some of these other two um, options. But uh, for me, most of the time, either auto or mass storage works fine connecting up your camera to your computer. All right, USB LUN setting. Um, if you're having problems with the USB connecting to your computer correctly, um, try either one of these two settings. Um, that might be the issue. You know, I've done a search on the manual and around the internet. I can't even tell you what LUN stands for. It must be some acronym for something, but uh, if you're having problems with USB, go here, try either one, and it might start working for you. A USB power supply. Um, like I've talked about before, you can actually um, charge the battery or operate it with the USB plugged into a wall outlet or a computer or wherever um, for a long period of time. Let's say you're doing a time lapse. Um, you could power it that way because the battery internally might not last it long. So you could possibly buy a USB uh, brick, I guess you could say, in terms of a battery, and then plug that into your camera, um, and then just let it run time-lapse-wise for a much longer period of time than you might otherwise get just on a single battery. All right, next up is language. 
if you're watching this, uh, hopefully you speak English is at least your secondary language. Um, otherwise, you probably never understood anything I just talked about. Uh, date and time setup. Um, hopefully you've already set this up. It's pretty intuitive. You can turn on daylight savings times for us weird people in the United States and time format and all that good stuff. Uh, area setting, same type of thing. I live in the Denver, Arizona time zone. So this is where you would set that up. Copyright info. So you can go in here and you can turn it on or off. It's basically just metadata for photos. It has nothing to do with video. So if you're wanting to go in and set up your all your information, this is definitely where you can do it. All right, this is where you go in and you can format your SD card. Uh, I, th I think it's a good standard practice to do this and rather than erasing the card, you would format it each time. That way you don't get corrupted data over time. It always You always start off with a clean slate, basically. So I would recommend formatting the car instead of erasing it. All right, next up, file number, we have series and reset. So basically what happens is if you're shooting photos and you never format the card, it'll count up from zero to like 9,999. When it gets to 10,000, it resets back to zero. I think all cameras do this. But let's say you never format the card and you always erase and you're starting a new time lapse and you don't want it to go into a new folder because when it creates that 10,000th 10 thousandths image for your time lapse, it creates a new folder and it can just be kind of a pain later. So if you want to start out at zero, you would hit reset. I leave it on series, but it doesn't do much good because every time I format the card, it brings everything back down to zero, which is unfortunate. When, the, uh, when I used to use Canon, it didn't do that. And I like the way it worked better just from you know, the way my brain works. One thing that might trip you up and make it very confusing, which confused the heck out of me is let's say you're at a particular job and you're saying, oh my gosh, I'm running out of storage space on my card. Let me delete these first two files that are really long. And I've done that and I've gone in and deleted them. And then when I go back later, what happens if I delete number one and number two video file, well, what happens when you record the next file, what does it do? It doesn't record like the 50th or 60th file or whatever, wherever number you're left off. It records back to number one, then it goes to number two, and then it jumps to 60. So it gets all out of whack, out of order. So that's another reason not to really delete anything out in the field um, if you're going to record past that. Um, the other thing is uh, each one of these files, video files, creates an XML file, and it shows information like the serial number and the date. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't show you like the f-stop number or any anything good. It doesn't really have any good information into it. So you might be asking, can I delete the XML file? Yes, you can definitely delete it or you don't have to transfer it to your computer. Um, there's really no need for it. It doesn't really pertain any really good information. Now, if you're wanting to go the opposite direction, let's say you've put it on your hard drive and you want to put it back on the card, for instance, um, without the XML files and put it back in the camera, then your camera is going to have a problem with that. It's going to say, oh, I don't know what the database is and I don't know, I don't see any XML files. So it might cause some confusion on that end. Select rec folder. It might be grayed out. Um, if it is, go down here to new folder and create a new one. You can see what we just created another one. And what I'm going to do here is create another one. So now when we go back up, you can actually select the recording folder between this one or that one. So let's say you're doing lots of different scenes. You could definitely do that. Um, however, I've never used this. And what the manual says is that this only works for still images and MP4 movies. Doesn't work for AVC HD or XAVC S. I don't know why. Um, so I've never used this. But I guess if you're recording different scenes, you got to a new scene, you could create a new folder and it'll be like, uh, a bit more organized. Um, I will tell you like the way the folder structure is um, coming off this card, it can be very confusing to find stuff because like I said, XAVCS is in one folder. You got AVC HD, another folder, MP4 is another folder. Um, it's very confusing to find stuff. All right, next up is folder name. You could do standard form or date form. Unfortunately, it doesn't do it for the actual file number itself. That would be kind of cool. You could change it, but this only changes it just for the name of the folder. Recover image database. So you can go in here and it'll actually maybe fix some of those XML files or do something to straighten up and do some tidy work to get things working again. Because sometimes it'll, and it's very, very rare, it'll say something like database error, would you like to recover? And you'd say yes. Or I guess you could just go to the menu and try to do it here. Um, in this case, it's going to check the database file and it says, hey, you have no errors found, so you're good to go. Display media info. So right here we can see uh, still images, nothing's 
done here because I'm in the movie mode. Movie mode, it shows XV, XAVCS HD. It says I can go two hours and 41 minutes. You really don't need to go to this page because if we go to the shooting area, you'll notice in the upper right hand corner is a shape of a, a memory card. It says two hours and 41 minutes. So you've already got that information. So you really don't need to ever get to this part of the menu. All right, next up is version. So we've already covered this already. Um, and then setting reset. So you've got two, this is kind of a, there's two different ones. Initialize will bring you way, way back. I think it keeps the time and date, but it brings, it resets basically everything in the camera. It'll even like get rid of your applications, like your time-lapse app. Camera um, settings reset. Like it talks about in the manual, initialize the main shooting settings to the default settings. So those like those first two tabs, uh, especially it resets everything back. And then what's really interesting is when you update the firmware, it's really smart. It doesn't like totally reset everything. It keeps all your settings in a separate file or something like that. Cause after it's done with the firmware, a lot of your settings are still in there from before, which is great. So this is like, if you want to really go way, way back, use the lower one, or if you just want to, somewhat reset it go here um, let's say so somebody borrows your camera and totally screws everything up you want to just start fresh um, i don't know maybe you would want to do that rather than the other one so that's pretty much it for the menu chapter